Welcome to Spiritual Transformation, where I interview the spiritually gifted and the spiritually transformed. I'm your host, Mary Beth, and I am thrilled to welcome my special guest today, Lincoln Gergar. Lincoln has a spiritual gift of channeling, and he channels the higher self. So what exactly is the higher self? Or what exactly is channeling? Well, I'm going to let Lincoln tell you in his own words, because he's the expert, not me. And we have a special treat because Lincoln has agreed to do a live channel session for us during this episode. So stay tuned. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe to this channel. And Lincoln, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, you have a great energy. I'm smiling ear to ear, just you know, loving your vibration. And I really appreciate this opportunity to spend some time with you and of course, to interact with your audience. And uh, yeah, hopefully we give them some new things, yes. and blow some people's minds, open some blow people's, some hearts, people's you know. minds. That yeah. is the goal. Yeah. And expand consciousness. Like that's why, yes. that's why I had you on here. And, you know, we had, I had two one-on-one -on -one sessions with you and my mind was literally blown. And I even told you. And this is why I wanted to introduce you to my audience is because like it felt like 10 years of therapy and you got rid of some programming that and that's why I said it that way. It probably would have taken 10 years to get rid of it on my own. So it's very valuable. And I had to share you too good to be kept a secret. So I'm going to read your short bio real quick and then we'll get right into the interview after that. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, guys, so since the age of 18, Lincoln Gergar has been helping people to awaken to who they are as the blissful consciousness creating their lives. At 25, Lincoln started teaching to a worldwide audience via YouTube, holding personal sessions and hosting in-person events. His Channel Higher Self videos have received over 5 million views, and he has held workshops in 13 countries on five continents. His life's work is helping people to awaken to their higher self state. So such a beautiful thing. What great work to be doing. I'm sure you're passionate about it. I know you are. And I wanna ask you a little bit about, um, I know some of your backstory, but I think uh, it'd be better for you to tell it. Uh, when you were a child, tell me a little bit, I know you had spiritual gifts your entire life, but tell me a little bit how it was, when it started, what was the catalyst for your awakening? Um, I would say the earliest memory I have of my awakening was around the age of like eight, nine or 10 years old. And I remember that because of how the furniture was arranged in my bedroom. So at night I would lay asleep in my bed and I would just think about existential topics, which I think is kind of odd for like, you know, a little kid to be doing. <laughs> so I would wonder like, yeah, most of us were eating crayons. <laughs> and paste. <laughs> paste. That yeah. was it. Everybody's paste, yeah. Um, so I didn't eat paste, not me. Um, so, uh, and I'm sure you didn't either. <laughs> I, I, might, I might have tried it, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> too bitter. <laughs> so, uh, so I would lay in bed at night and I would think about these different questions. Like when my mom, who would tuck me in at night, you know, and kiss me to bed, and then she'd like walk out of the room and I stopped like hearing her footsteps. And in my perception, she stopped existing. And I wondered, like, does my mom really exist? Like, does she, does anything exist outside of me perceiving it? Because how can I actually prove that? And then I was thinking, well, if I asked like my dad, because my dad's in the house, what my mom was doing after she left my bedroom, he can tell me. But then again, the only thing I can actually validate is what I'm experiencing. And that's that my dad is telling me a story about what my mom did. I can't actually validate that what he perceived was true because I didn't have that experience. So I was like looking at the nature of consciousness when I was a little kid and I was just lying at night and uh, thinking through all these different aspects of how reality works. That is deep. Yeah, definitely. I don't think that's a typical eight or nine year old. So you kind of knew. So were you seeing things into the spiritual realm or anything like that? I had a few experiences at night also, like lucid dream experiences and out-of-body experiences in other dimensions. And I had met some spiritual guides. Uh, I think it may have happened like as I was just starting to go through puberty because I had mm -hmm. different really strong energetic dreams. Uh, like a snake was in my bed one time, this giant snake. 
And I didn't know what that meant. And later on, I learned about the Kundalini and how mm-hmm. the energy starts awakening um, when you're going through puberty because of the, the sexual orientation of the energies in your body prior to developing your genitals, the energy is developing your pineal gland and your pituitary gland. So now the hormone structure starts changing. Energy goes down to the bottom of your chakra system. And that also starts to facilitate the awakening of all your creative energy as a human being. Because when you go through puberty, like you're on fire and you want to meet people and you want to do things and you're thinking about how you want to change the world. So when this yeah. started happening in me, I was having like these really strange symbolic dreams that were really strong enough to wake me up in the middle of the night because they felt so real. And I remember I, I found you on Next Level Soul, which is a, my favorite podcast with Alex Ferrari. Love it so much. Um, and that's where I found you. And I'm like, I know that I need to talk to this guy. Like I just like intuitively knew and um yeah you had told a story i also have had dreams that come true and then that alone is enough for you to be like wait a minute things aren't what (laughs) they seem to be if i'm able to have predictive dreams what does that say about time you know and i've had that ever since i was a child too. have dreams that come true and they're very different from your regular dream they're more vivid like Mm -hmm. a movie kind of yeah definitely yeah and i've uh i've taken that experience because it happened I think like 14 to 17 18 maybe um, that was when it kept happening in real powerful ways and then it got less as i got older but i still have them every once in a while and i learned to work with it more so to the point where i can remote view into experiences and remote view possibilities in the future with verifiable accuracy um, and that's something i do with my personal life i don't advertise myself as a psychic i have no interest in that um, for a large part because I personally don't ask my own higher self and look into the universe about my future experiences because it takes a lot of the fun and excitement and joy out of being human. Because if we have too much information, we lose that spark of life. And I think sometimes people are obsessed with being able to know the future because they're struggling in the present, enjoying their life and enjoying the creative process. And we're really here to exist in time and not beyond time. Like what I do as a channel is I go beyond time and I can bring through information from these non-physical spiritual places and it exists there. And it definitely adds to the quality of our experience, but that part of our human personality that wants to know the future, to control their life and never suffer and always be happy, that part needs to be worked through because that's the part that needs to be healed and grown up and transformed. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't do psychic stuff, because sometimes you attract those clients that aren't doing the inner work on themselves and they want someone else to guarantee their future happiness so they can feel safe right now. And that's not how we should develop that feeling of safety. Our safety should come through learning how to trust ourselves and learning how to trust the interactive process with life. And then also realizing failure and difficulty is a part of life. Like we're going to fail countless times. In fact, we're going to fail more times than we're going to (laughs) succeed because until you actually reach the goal, you're learning, you're growing, you're trying this, you're trying that. Some people judge those as little failures. I don't, I think it's all growth. Every new experience and clear our disappointments, we're learning, we're growing, moving forward. But that painful part of our mind, you know, calls us a failure. We call ourselves failures. And and I think we got to work through that piece because once we work through that, we love life. And we embrace life in a greater way and it becomes an adventure and a joy. So for myself, that that experience of premonitional dreams, it has less value the older I get Mm -hmm. because I really just enjoy the mystery and the magic and the interactive nature of human life. I feel more alive and like my emotions come alive because I'm embracing the the mystery and you know the creative excitement. I love it. And and just like you said, like I do talk to psychics sometimes. I have friends that are psychics. I've had I just, my whole life's been like one big paranormal experience. So I've definitely like delved into that whole thing. But what I do know and what I tell everybody is don't give your power away to a psychic because at the end of the day, we create our own reality Mm -hmm. and they might, I use them still because I like the guidance and then be like, oh, I didn't like what she or he said, so I'm going to tweak it. But I, but that's coming from the creator aspect. Like I know, like if I keep going this direction, that's all they can see. All they can see is your your current energy, your current vibration, and we still have the power to shift 
whatever we need to shift and and not go that direction. So that's why I talk to him. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Maybe a little yeah. of addiction, maybe. <laughs> a, a fun one. Yeah. It's <laughs> very fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can't um, quit drinking alcohol. I got to have something. <laughs> you got to do something fun. Yeah, because most of my friends, you know, they have psychic abilities and like we love just looking at things and, you know, projecting our consciousness out and seeing what's there. And and also we use it skillfully in order to improve our experiences. So if you... Like I work with some clients with business deals. And so if you're working with a business deal, it's very valuable to be able to gather more information by using your psychic skills. It's not about predicting the future, controlling the future. It's about gathering information. Like who is this person who wants to partner with me? Like what mm -hmm. qualities do they have? Because we can remote view that. And beyond space and time, we can understand these are the characteristics of their personality. And are they telling us the truth about something that they have? You know, are they really interested in our, you know, this type of project? Or are they trying to, you know, steal something? Because yeah. there's a lot of fraudulent business activity online right now, unfortunately. So psychic skills are very valuable. I use them in a lot of ways, but I don't use them in ways that I feel would detract from the quality of my life. Because like you said, you're the creator and you're always the one that's going to shape your reality. We have all these probable futures coming at us and where we put our energy right now determines what pieces of those different possibilities we put into our life. So and to use that like remote viewing and, and, and intuition and things like for like when you get a client, like when I signed up for your services, when I wanted to do a session, were you like remote viewing in my head, like seeing like, let me check this chick out. Let me make sure, because you, I mean, it might be valuable though, like to know, is this person really worth a good energy exchange? Cause I know we don't want to exchange energy with just anybody. Um, for me, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, for my clients, no, because mm -hmm. my role as a channel is really just to facilitate a service. Mm -hmm. It's me allowing this higher consciousness to come through. And I trust that the people who are attracted to me as a channel, that I'm here to serve them from this higher state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to work for them. It's real interesting, like an earlier story, when I was first starting out channeling, I get some people that would post comments on my videos and send me emails and they would treat me like I have to do what they say. Like you have to channel for me. And even if I'm not gonna give you a donation, like you have to do it, it's your duty as a spiritual person. Or you mm -hmm. give these teachings about being you know, divine and love and saint-like, well, saints don't charge money, so I want you to work with me. And the energy was all wrong. And so my alignment is not with this type of person. My alignment's with the will of God, with the higher self. Does my intuition say, yes, this is someone to work with? Um, but in terms of remote viewing people, now I really have no interest. And, uh, and for me, I love meeting new people. I love how life unfolds. There's so much joy in like the unknown and the surprise. Like even when I was a young kid, like, you know, birthdays and Christmas and these holidays, they were so fun because of the surprise element, yeah. like not knowing something is magical. And if we can be embracing life with an open heart instead of fear and anxiety, then we can really like connect with that magical part of life and enjoy the opportunities. And we all have Good desires point. for future experiences. And sometimes that desire gets like tied up in fear. Like, what if I'm not going to get what I want? But then we have to learn to untie that fear and start developing trust in ourselves that, yes, I deserve what I want. And if we start looking for evidence in our life, we realize the universe is always bringing us what matches us. So how I think and feel is always influencing the people and the events I draw to myself. Yes. If we just start paying attention, we realize I am a creator. It's not a belief. It's a fact because it's verifiable evidence and it can't be disproven. You know, there's alignments because we're all co-creating. So sometimes the aspects are a little more difficult to find, but we are expressing into our reality and influencing what happens here. I think some people just think there's evidence to disprove it only because they don't realize the subconscious programming that they have yeah. that's influencing things yeah. because by definition, they're not conscious of it. So, and yeah. that's what I had to learn is like, okay, well, I was thinking that for a long time, like, Law of attraction is hard. Well, no, it's inner work. It's not magical thinking. It's inner work. It and is, once yeah. you once you realize you you know you've got to make the subconscious programming, you've got to make it conscious into your awareness. That's where you can heal it, and that's where you can actually make the shift. Mm -hmm. And it's not like a quick fix, like people think. I mean, it's always working. The law of attraction is always working. We're always manifesting, but are we manifesting what we desire mm -hmm. <laughs> or yeah. what we don't want? Because most of the time. 
what most time people have some negative thinking, right? So <laughs> that's what do. we gotta. Yeah, it's part so of the have, reality of being human. Yeah, it's beautiful. Conquer that. But yeah, I'm glad yeah. that I don't have the gift of remote viewing. I'd probably abuse it. God knew not to give me that one. <laughs> You'd be spying on your neighbors. <laughs> I would be abusing that very often. So that's probably good. So what is the, okay, first of all, what is channeling? And then I'm going to ask you, what is the higher self? So let's okay. let's get all there. Right. For, for my audience, not every, I know there's going to be a lot of people who are like, what in the heck is channeling? Yeah. So when I channel, I expand my own personal consciousness. So all the aspects of myself start to change and go into a higher level of functioning. So I have awareness and usually the awareness is just tied to the five physical senses. So I'm seeing and hearing and touch, taste and smelling. When I start expanding my consciousness, I start to see with my mind's eye and I start to feel with my energy body and I start to hear with my mind. Okay. So instead of hearing with my ears and seeing with my eyes and feeling with my skin, these non-physical senses that we all have, they start waking up. Yeah. When I channel, I expand myself into that non-physical state first, but then I also connect my personal intelligence as well as I can into the universal mind. So my experience, and it started just as a belief, but then I had to gather evidence and validate it for myself. My experience is that we're all part of one consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, I call it like the mind of God or the self or the source. There's one intelligent field of awareness and energy that is existence. And we're all coming out of it. We're all existing inside of it. And I've learned how to connect more into that experience. So like you and I were talking before the, the video came on, I was raised Catholic. And so you have this understanding mm -hmm. of what God is, you know, and you're brought up that way. And then I started listening to what Jesus was actually saying. Instead of what like the priests were saying about Jesus, I was listening mm -hmm. to what Jesus, is, what Jesus was saying in these books, right? And he's talking about like, I and my father are one. And I'm like, okay, Jesus is saying he's like one with God and like all these miracles and all this knowledge came through Jesus Christ. And I'm like, huh, so if he can do it, we all can do it because he also said we could. So I'm he a little kid learning We can do it this. and more. Yeah, he yeah. Said, yeah. Like, literally, it's in the Bible. Oh, everybody yeah. ignores that part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's so much more for us. So I just started processing life, of course, not believing I'm Jesus, but knowing, like, like you said, we can do so many things, so many great things that we're not aware of yet. And it made sense logically that I'm part of the universe. So what if I can telepath to the universe? And it didn't happen right away. I, I practiced meditation for many years. And then I started noticing that there was this other voice appearing inside of my head. So when I was meditating, I would silence my voice. So I had no thoughts and I would just stare at the white wall of my bedroom. And I learned how to just sit there in this state of meditative awareness, stopping my thinking, stopping my emotional feelings, and then noticing that my consciousness is expanding. I'm feeling like I am getting bigger than my body and more non-physical things are happening. So then when I was in college, I started noticing that there was another voice that would follow my voice. And the way it first appeared is my human voice had its conditioning. You know, we all have conditioning and I would, you know, complain about things or I would like put somebody down in my thoughts, just like walking to class. Like, I don't know this person, but my mind was just unhappy about something. And immediately this new voice came in and corrected it. And it like told me what I like really knew, like my wisdom. And it was like, huh. And I was confused at first because I'm a meditator and in Zen meditation, you're not supposed to think. And as I'm trying to walk to class in this meditative state, my human mind gets triggered sometimes to think about what I'm seeing. And this thought comes in that changes the negative thinking. And I'm thinking, okay, am I doing that? Because I'm supposed to be meditating, you know? And I realized no, part of meditation is just trusting the process. So I'm going to stay in meditative awareness, whatever my mind does, let it happen. And I noticed that my mind was correcting itself. Now, I thought this was just my mind correcting itself. Because right. I didn't know that a higher self existed until, I don't know, 20. Like, I didn't know about channeling until I was like 22, I think. And I was in college at like 19 when this was starting. And so, and I didn't even know there was a higher self until I started channeling and it wanted to be called the higher self. And I'm like higher self that doesn't work with me <laughs> because for me i was studying all these eastern spiritual traditions into combination with christianity and all that to try and balance get a whole world perspective of like what we're, people are talking about on this planet you know <laughs> and um 
And I thought like, no, we're all one self. So I don't like higher. And like, the truth is we're not even like a, a personal self. We're like the universe. So I don't like higher self. Mm -hmm. And it said, no, that's what we want to be called. Like, okay. <laughs> and then I looked it up and I'm realizing, oh, like other people have mentioned the higher self and it's like our inner teacher. Yeah. So there's like a part of my mind that started teaching me. Yeah. And it was happening for years until I actually like asked it its name because I asked its name when I was channeling the videos and I needed to call my YouTube channel something. I said, okay, well, what are you? What should I tell people I'm talking with? Because in my personal language, I said it was the mind of God, like, or the universe, like I'm talking to the universe, <laughs> you know, but I thought it was like, you know, my mind, but on a bigger, more blown up level. Um, so it wanted to be called the higher self. And I realized that all of us are like shrunken down versions of God we have all the same properties of God. So we're aware, intelligent, and creative. And when we go into deeper states of meditation, the forms of the physical world disappear. And what remains are these three properties. I'm still aware. There's a silent intelligence. So I know I exist. I know what's happening in the present moment while I'm in this deep state of consciousness. So there's an intelligence at work. And then also there is an experience and there's energy. So there's creative energy manifesting all the forms I'm aware of, but even in these subtle states in meditation, there's still some type of energy appearing. Yeah. And so that's like the foundation of us. And then I can logically extrapolate and realize like the whole universe is made of these qualities. And in India, they talk about this as well as something called Sat Chit Ananda. And, um, and that was called like truth, consciousness, and bliss. Um, and, but it's just, I, I usually call it awareness, intelligence, and energy, because it's more Western. It's easier to understand. So truth would be like knowledge. Consciousness would be like awareness. Um, cause we use consciousness differently in the West than the East mm -hmm. and on does energy. They call it bliss. I call it life energy. Um, so, so we're basically miniature versions of the source and like we fractals. are, yeah, yeah. Like fractals, but also we forgot the completeness that we were. So we are like holograms of God. So a hologram has everything of the one thing and all the little many things. So our potential is to awaken to full spiritual realization where we actually function at these highest levels in which we have the mind of God. So we know everything. We have the creative power of God so we can manifest everything. We have the awareness of God so we can perceive everything. So that would be like theoretically where we're all headed. And when we awaken spiritually, what happens? We gain more knowledge, we gain more creative power, so we can influence our life more, and we gain more awareness. We can perceive more of like what's going on and we can understand things better. So our whole journey of spiritual awakening, according to me, is we develop ourselves as participants of life. And the godlike qualities of ourselves, they grow and expand into more universal states. And, and there's the a theory that God's experiencing itself through us right so you have to go through that amnesia you have to and then in 3d reality kind of like you were kind of i don't like calling it the higher self but i've had this conversation i mean i could be totally wrong about this but i've had this conversation with people it's like i think we're supposed to have duality here we're we're spiritual beings yes but we're having a human experience in a 3d reality physical reality so there are it's okay to kind of label things in this reality as dark and light like it doesn't mean better or worse but there's higher and there's lower frequencies and i think that's just be not not maybe on the other side but while we're here on earth school we'll call it there's there is some duality right there's yeah you can, there's things we can put label on things that really probably wouldn't have a label because it's all like technically god experiencing itself at different frequencies you know even even the yeah. very lower ones, but yeah, yeah, and I think you're exactly right. And the lower ones are not bad or wrong. That's how I look at it, anyway. It's just a different but experience. I, it's a different experience, and it a bad experience or a lower experience has less happiness. And for me, happiness is unity. So yes. the more I connect to what I desire, the more I can actually perceive it, understand it, and experience its energy. Then the more unity I have with that experience, and I have more happiness then. So it's like, if I connect with life, I get more energy. Well, that feels better. I call it happiness, yeah. right? If I understand it, there's a happiness to knowing something. 
So I have more knowledge, that's more happiness. And perceiving more of it means I know it more. Like the more we get to know something, the more we perceive something and the deeper into something we can perceive, the more happiness. So if we get to know our friends on deeper levels, we have more happiness. We feel like I know them more, I'm more connected to them. So for me, the unhappiness is more separation consciousness. And then the greater happiness states are more unity consciousness. And all the frequencies of life exist in this range. Separation consciousness is based upon forgetting I'm one with everything, which is right. the same as saying forgetting I'm God. And then unity consciousness is- Which real. would be the original sin is forgetting that we're all connected. That's right. Yeah, we step down and so we suffer. And then the whole journey is going back to source or going back to unity consciousness, going back to God realization. Um, so for me, I don't think anything is like, I, I don't like the terminology we use because everyone infers these words differently, but nothing's like evil. Yeah. Things are harmful, definitely. Yeah. But for me, everything's God and it's just greater or lesser forms of happiness and suffering. And so of course, I don't want to harm anybody. And I don't want to be harmed, but I don't like the word evil because it usually connotes that something else is doing it to me. And it's like this opposite of God idea of Satan. Yeah. It's like, I don't think there's anything opposite of God. I think there are people who are very harmful and people who are very ignorant and they think everything is separate and like, you're going to hurt me. So I'm going to kill you first. Like there's some really low level consciousness here on the planet that does a lot of destruction, but I see it as all the process of awakening and not this conflict of God fighting against some opposite force. Well, they're disconnected souls. They're disconnected from yeah. who they really are. From, yeah, they're and, suffering and, a lot. Because right. you had happiness to your friendships because you're a happy person. And someone who's depressed, they had depression. Mm -hmm. So we have people who are psychotic, who think in violent <laughs> ways, and they're going to act in violent ways. And yeah. they should not be given positions of power. <laughs> so I wanted to ask subject. you about the, um, you had the brain testing done. Is yeah. that called an EEG? Uh, yeah, an EEG, and I had a, a brain map put on my head. So I had like 20 some different electrodes on this cap that I wore, and I have a video footage. I recorded the whole thing while we were doing it. Um, and so I have this brain cap on, and then they put like gel to make sure the electrodes touch your scalp. Um, I had things up my nose and things on my ears. <laughs> I had wrist straps, I had finger things. I had a, a band around my heart, something that measured the electricity of my heart. Um, and they, so they strapped me in, I was sitting in this chair and then they had like two or three computers connected to it. And they asked me to do different things like meditate and do remote viewing and look at something in the physical world. And then also look at something in the non-physical world, uh, channel, go into my spiritual heart, which is the center of ourselves, like the soul. And they wanted to see what was happening in my brain and also in the electricity of my heart and my whole nervous system. So I was all plugged in. So it was really cool because we got to see in real time on these different computer screens what was happening and the emotions I was in and the, the different brain waves that were related to the state I was in. And yeah, it was fascinating. And we got to prove that in different states, my brain actually changed mm -hmm. and my emotions also were able to demonstrate how I feel and how that changes when I'm in a channeled state or when I'm in meditation uh, so it was really, really cool to get an objective observation of something that I've been experiencing inside myself for most of my life. And I never got to see it objectively measured on a computer with all these advanced scientific tools. So that was a lot that's, of fun. That's very cool. I love the technology is finally catching up with everything, you know, and mm -hmm. of course, quantum physics, like quantum physics is like the, to me, that's what we need to be looking at more than anything is quantum physics. That's where it's at. Like, um, I think that i mean, ever since maybe I want to say the twenties, but I might be wrong, but consciousness is creating our experience. Right. I think that's like the main definition. And mm -hmm. if we can wrap our brains around that, then, you know, you can understand like, okay, the things that we're taught <laughs> are not necessary. I mean, we're definitely limiting ourselves yeah. by the physical sciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that's great exactly technologies right. come catching up with us. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great way to say it, that our understanding was limited. 
because we weren't wrong. We're just expanding our definitions and expanding our perception of what's happening in life. And that again is just what's going on in our personal awakening process. So society's awakening with more accurate sciences and introducing non-physical sciences like quantum physics. And then a personal level, we're becoming intuitive. We're feeling energy. We're realizing there's telepathic things going on inside of my mind, like channeling and getting messages. So like this whole structure of planet earth is ascending and awakening into these greater experiences, which also then is greater states of unity. We're happier as we connect more with life and as we perceive more things. So it's a really exciting time. Absolutely. So before we start the channel session, so I know you have no desire to change anybody's viewpoints. Um, for my audience who might be more like on the religious side, maybe feel like they, because they were probably taught something like that channeling could be evil and that coming from a bad source. Is there anything that you could say to them to soothe them so they could feel okay listening to it? So, or, or you know, or, or yeah. maybe there's nothing you could say, but. Oh, no, there's always ask. something I can add. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have two university degrees, one in psychology and also one in religious studies. So I studied and earned a degree in the world religions. So my desire as a young person was to understand how life works. So I figured I'll study psychology to understand the mind and I'll study religion to understand our relationship to the universe and to the powers creating us. Um, so I, I have a lot of personal experience coming from that world of religion and the world of you know, academic psychology. And then through my own process of growth and awakening, having more non-physical experiences, um, looking at ancient religions as well, like the Eastern religions and, and meditation practices um, to really just understand more of what reality is. So the ancient yeah. religions were trying to answer difficult questions. Like, what is the purpose of life? And why are we here? And is there something creating us? And also, how can we get along together? Because a lot of the pieces of religion are just about social interaction, create a healthy society and healthy families. So we've just expanded upon that. I think sometimes in the modern day world, people like to be against things. And I'm generally not against anything. I see it's all just growth. Um, so for me, the religions aren't against spirituality the religions have evolved into a greater understanding because of science, like you said, quantum physics, because of discussions with other cultures, because of implementing different practices, like just mindfulness and observing what's happening. So for me, what I experience as channeling is just a more advanced experience of our own personal reality. I've learned how to through meditation and all these things I've done within myself, I've learned how to connect with a greater consciousness. And even to tie it into religions, in the books, we've always had prophets. I don't consider myself a prophet, but if I look at what a prophet has done, they said they received messages. Right. Like Moses went up and said, yeah, like God gave me these rules and they're called the commandments and this is how we're supposed to live and we'll do a good job together. So he channeled something from this universal mind, possibly. I wasn't there, but that's what we're <laughs> led to believe, you know? Um, and we see these prophets in a lot of different religions. And in each case, they received some knowledge that was greater than their own. I've just worked with it for 20 years for, I don't even know, tens of thousands of hours because I've channeled so much for people and so much just for myself. And that has developed my ability to get information out of the universe in very precise ways honoring again what jesus said ask and ye shall receive so it's like, okay i'll ask and i just had to learn how to listen that's and law of attraction can, right there yeah, yeah, <laughs> asking it's given yeah and it happens in all law of attractions the all over the bible it is it definitely is yeah because these are truths about us mm -hmm. all these cultures at all these different times were trying to write down these ideas they had about how life worked and we're just expanding upon it in our own way. That's how I, I see all of this. And for me, I was very scientific. So I wouldn't just believe something because someone told me it. I wanted my own evidence. I wanted to prove it to myself before I believed it because I didn't want to fool myself. And I didn't want to walk around you know, making mistakes and being confident when I really shouldn't be. And so I investigated these different things. And I had to go on my journey to prove that something was true for me. 
So when I channel, I'm not expecting anybody to just believe it because I say it. I wouldn't want you to do that because I wouldn't do that. I would say, listen, take it in. Maybe you'll feel some non-physical Yeah, go with your feelings. Yeah, maybe some emotions will change. Maybe the quality of your mind will change because there is a genuine energetic difference that the audience can experience when they connect while I channel for them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I definitely feel that, you know, because I've done the sessions with you and I could tell my vibrations lifted during the sessions. Um, And just my personal opinion about like, you know, channeling and um profits and things like that like to me life is all about growth and expansion so why in the world would we think that god stopped talking to us during the bible like there's all there's I, I think people are always given all of this knowledge and downloads i've gotten downloads you know um that my, my yeah we all get downloads every single one i think we don't recognize it as, as that way though. I think we, we just sometimes think it's just, but yeah, we, I, I definitely think that everybody, everybody's always, we're always growing. We're always expanding. God didn't stop talking to like conversations with God was one of the first books that I read that was about the channel, the Neil Donald Walsh. And I was like, that resonated with me big time. And that's when I got into the whole like channeling. That was a long time ago too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was a kid when that came out. Yeah. The old book. Um, yeah. I'm older than you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When um, I first read that, I was like, I started to really like, I've been into this stuff for a long time. I was just kind of in the spiritual closet. Yeah. Well, it had to be in a lot of ways. I think you said something important. You asked a a, important question. Why are we afraid to embrace the changes over time with religion and other eras? And I, it's, I believe it's because of the punishment that we get threatened by. So we Mm -hmm. will get ostracized from our religious communities. If we ask certain questions or if we even act, even talk about certain ideas, and we're seeing that and now in the modern day world as well, but it's always been here. Social structures have wanted to hold themselves together. And if you're a free thinker, you're a threat to some of these social structures. So people are afraid of losing their family and their friends or jobs or like different parts of their life just because they think different. And so people had to, you know, hide it within themselves, go into this closet and just, I'm going to learn about it on my own, but not talk and share. Um, so it's a lot of social fears that we have because our society has encouraged us to be closed-minded in a lot of ways. And that's a detriment to our own growth because we should be talking. We should have friendly conversations and we should try to understand as much as we can about our realities. We have to think logically like so many, so many different religions, they all believe they're 100% right. And everybody else is, you know, going to hell or whatever. Like that doesn't even make sense. You just have to think logically like... They can't all be right. So yeah. But it sure does it sure does feel good to think that you're right and think everybody else is wrong. <laughs> that's pretty addictive. That's yeah, an that's get, a very oh, addictive addic- thing. Yeah, addicted to pride. Yeah. <laughs> so this is actually a good transition into um a, a question that I want to ask the higher self. Are you are you ready to do yeah, can sure, I talk to anything. the higher self? Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll just start channeling. And in the beginning, I'll go into this state and then I'll provide just a short alignment meditation takes a few, like 30 seconds or so. And it's just going to guide the audience to feel their heart and notice Mm -hmm. themselves as the deeper state of awareness, right? You're not connecting to anything other than you. Yes. Heart and your awareness. And then once you're in that state, just try to stay in that deeper state because the words of our conversation will land in a deeper place. We're becoming better listeners, better receivers, and also awakening to our non-physical selves. So we might notice that we're having some unique experiences during this conversation. Okay. All right. You ready, Mary Beth? I am ready. (laughs) All right. Okay. I'll now begin. Dear one, close your eyes. Feel the center of your chest. Be at peace. Relax into yourself. Relax into the feeling of your heart. Notice this gentle quality of energy. There's a feeling of life inside of your heart creative energy. 
Feel your heart's energy. Feel its natural expression, the shining feeling, and be at peace with it. Relax with it. You, dear one, are God. You are the universal source having a personal experience. You are God existing within eternity, experiencing one of an infinite number of possibilities. Feel your heart and feel the uniqueness of yourself. Here in your heart shines you. It's a feeling of your radiance, of your connection. And the more you live feeling your heart, the more you will express these deeper parts of yourself. And you will change your thinking and your emotions will feel different. You will begin creating a heart-centered life and this is different than a head-centered life. In your spiritual heart, we are not chasing emotions. We are feeling our creative self shining into the present moment. We are feeling ourself as this deeper consciousness. So stay here as your deeper self while we speak together. And now, dear one, you would like to ask us a question? Yes, I would. This one was submitted by an audience member. Uh, can the higher self give, give us advice on how we can find peace and hope among today's current events and all of the divi division in our world? And what can we do as individuals to help expand the consciousness of the collective? Well, the first thing to do, dear one, is to recognize the creative power within you. And this power it needs to come through you. You need to give yourself permission to express into the physical world. You see, you are a multidimensional being. We all are. And this is not a mystery, and this is not something only special people get to experience. You already have different layers of your human self existing in different dimensions. And your mind is a non-physical energy body. And your emotions are another layer of energy. And then you have the physical body made of matter. Your physical body has a nervous system and a brain, but your mind is actually something greater. You can feel the space around your physical body. You can all do this now. Feel the space around your head and your shoulders and your chest. And you will notice you actually feel a part of yourself growing larger than the feeling of the physical body of matter. And this is evidence that you are already larger than your physical body because you experience yourself there. And this is part of your mind. Your mind is like the aura and nearly all of you understand the aura. So your mind exists as a non-physical state, and you use your mind, you use your understanding to create emotional feelings. And that body of emotional energy connects your mind with your physical body. All of these chakras are connections from your mind to your body. This is why the emotions are needed to be felt and expressed to carry your ideas into the physical world to change matter. If you want to attract something in the physical world of matter, you have to connect your understanding, connect your ideas, connect your desires, connect your mind with matter. And the emotion is the key because it's the energy body existing between these two layers. So when you, dear one, want to change the world, you have to feel alive. 
You have to give yourself permission to feel the emotion that's inside of your human body. And then when you feel alive, you create the idea. So if you pray for world peace, you have to feel the strength of your desire that you want to have peace in this world. And even better than only feeling the desire, create the feeling of peace. Create the peace and the desire. And now you're creating a more complete understanding that you're giving to your body to feel and also putting into matter. For those of you who are aware of energy, you'll notice you can feel the emotion expressing through your body and into the space in front of your body. And some of you who are empathic, you can also feel the emotion of other people being expressed towards you. And so the emotional energy also goes into the world and it influences the world. If you, dear ones, are attending a gathering, attending a party celebration, when you're walking up to the home or the room where the party is at, you will start to feel the emotional energy of the people at the party. You're not even seeing who's there. You're not imagining it. Of course, you might be excited about the party, but you're also feeling the energy of the party. Maybe you go to a party that's a dud and you say, the energy's dead here. Let's get out of here. You're feeling the energy that we put into life and we change matter this way. So each and every one of you are incredibly powerful creators. And if you learn to control your mind, then you will be able to choose the understanding that you want to feel and deliver that into the body. And don't be afraid. The biggest reason why we fail at changing our lives is because we're afraid to succeed. And sometimes we convince ourselves to be afraid for logical reasons, but other times those reasons are very, very deep within because they come from our childhood experiences. But understand the way to break through fear is not to fight against it. It is instead to believe in yourself and strengthen your desire because your desire carries the energy into your body. So the more you desire something, the more you overpower your avoidance strategies and all the fear-based mechanisms that work in your psyche. If you want something, you'll realize, I got to stop complaining because it's not helping me. When your desire is really strong, you'll think, I got to give more time to this. I got to stop procrastinating and avoiding what I know I need to do. So fear creates procrastination and complaining, things that push away what we want. And if we come into our desire and recognize I can have it, I can succeed, then we will automatically feel more energy connecting and our body will make different choices. We'll have different thoughts. So you have to recognize yourself as this creator. And when you can do this, you will learn how this creative process works. It's mind into emotion. The emotion connects mind to the physical body. Give yourself permission to express your body into the world. This carries mind and emotion into the world. And now you've completed this connection that is the process of manifestation. If you, dear one, do not know how to change the world because you say, what can I do just living at my home? I'm not in a political position. I don't have any other means. You, dear one, can recognize you have the power of your thought. You have the power of prayer. And you have the power of kindness. Because, dear ones, if you spread kindness to the people around you, you improve the happiness in their lives. And happy people do not fight. When you put happiness in the world, you create cooperation. Even if you interact with people with different understandings and different appearances from different cultures and you feel happy, those people are not a problem. The reason why wars continue to exist is because people are unhappy in their lives. So they're fighting within themselves. They're complaining, they're arguing, they're angry and upset. They're feeling defeated. There is a war inside of themselves and that is causing internal damage. And they're not happy in this world. And that inner vibration gets expressed into the world. Inner and outer, they create similar experiences. The only way that war is possible is if human beings are unhappy inside. So you can do your part adding kindness, sharing a smile, telling someone thank you, telling a friend you appreciate them, telling your family you love them. 
you dear ones can raise the vibration of this universe in such simple ways that are incredibly potent. So don't ever think there's nothing you can do. You can do so much because you've been given time and the present moment and the world you live in, the people around you, and you've been given the free will to choose what to put into this shared experience. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, another question that was submitted was on sickness and self-healing. Um, they mentioned like the placebo and nocebo effect. So if we, if that's possible, there has to be um, some form of self-healing. And then are diseases karmic, spiritual, environmental, genetic, or a combo? And is there anything that we can do to prevent major illnesses such as cancer, if anything? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, first, dear ones, the power of your mind is great. In fact, it is so great it can eliminate all illness from the planet. But simply wanting to be healthy is not enough. That does create health. Whatever you desire in a very literal way, you will create. But the problem that we have is there are other beliefs about ourselves. One of the biggest blocks to experiencing whatever you like is the feeling of unworthiness. And so you might have shame or guilt or doubt, a difficulty trusting God, and you might believe I'm unworthy to have what I want. That's like telling the universe, oh, bring that to me. Oh, no, wait, hold on, stop. I cannot have it. Oh, wait, bring that to me. Oh, no, wait, stop right there. I won't receive it. So sometimes we get half healthy, but not healed. Sometimes you notice progress, and then it seems to stop. If we observe our minds, we can realize that if any doubt or fear shame or guilt, confusion, any of these resistant emotions are coming up, then we're going to be putting breaks on this process of completed success. Now, in terms of physical illness, there are factors of the world that influence us, but please understand your understanding and your beliefs about yourself and about life determine the choices you make. And therefore, what you put in your body as food and nourishment who you put in your life as relationships, including whom you trust to guide you in healthy decisions like your doctors or your givers of medicine. And so, yes, the physical world influences us. The air we breathe influences us. The people we interact with influence us. And the life we are living is our own creation. As a young child, of course, you're not free. You're influenced by your family because you're not old enough to make your decisions in the world. Your societal structures will not allow many of these decisions to take place. And also, your brain has not developed in a sufficient way to allow the fullness of your consciousness to come through. So young children, we can make an exception because they're not realizing themselves as creators just yet. But for an adult, you really have freedom. And this journey of enlightenment is waking up to recognize the creative responsibility you have at leading your own life. So if you have illness, you should accept. There's parts of me, and maybe I don't know them just yet. Maybe I'm familiar with some, but not all of them. There are parts of me that are creating this illness. You see, then you take responsibility, because if there are parts of you that are creating the illness then you can change those parts and heal the illness. But if you believe that the world is attacking you and the world has viruses and all of these unproven things, and I know many of you will be upset with this, but please, dear ones, look into the research. If you believe, dear one, that the, that the world is attacking me, then you will feel powerless. And then, dear ones, you will continue to give away your free will choices and trust in people who also agree with this system of powerlessness. And so it's difficult to heal your body with desire alone because everyone desires to be healthy, but you have to have a more awakened understanding and take responsibility for the experiences in your life. And again, you may not know what is causing it, and that is the awakening process. You won't have all the answers, but if you accept responsibility, you will realize how powerful you are at creating change. So from our perspective, all physical illness is driven by our understanding of life. It's not necessarily the cause that medicine identifies, but if you start tracing back how these physical experiences happened, 
It's because of the choices that you made. And when you're a child, those choices are made by your parents. But to look at an evolutionary perspective, your soul consciousness chose those parents and chose the conditions of your childhood to bring about these experiences. And that was creating the foundation of your journey of awakening. So we're not blaming anyone. We're rather taking responsibility that, yes, there are different layers of myself, including non-physical ones that are influencing my reality. And there are layers of myself physically as well. The more I can awaken, the more I can perceive those layers and work with those layers and thus create the success I want. So we have to look at our relationships and say, how are my relationships poisoning me? How are they harming my emotions and lowering the vitality of my body? It's already been identified by modern day science and widely held belief that stress causes illness. In fact, they will say stress is the number one cause of illness. Well, what is stress? Stress, dear one, is an emotional feeling of discomfort. And what creates our emotions, our understanding. Now, one day, of course, modern day medicine is going to try to remove that because, well, you they don't believe that there is such a thing as the mind or such a thing as the emotions. They believe it's all physical and it's all cause and effect and the environment controls you. But that's their model and that's the direction of ignorance being expressed. You see, in your human experience, you can move towards unity or move towards separation. You move along this timeline. And the more you recognize the creative power you have, the more you recognize your oneness with life. And the more you believe in powerlessness, the more you create a feeling like you don't want to participate here. And that's a feeling of separation. So you can go through your world and you can ask yourself, does this make me feel powerless or powerful? Does this acknowledge me as a part of life that has the power to influence what happens? Or does this make me feel powerless, like I have no choice but to listen to the people around me? Again, remember, these beliefs are human created. So you're listening to human beings that want you to give up your personal authority and listen to theirs. Because after all, the person who makes all the decisions is the person who rules the world. So it's time, dear one, to take your power back. Not power over anyone, but power within yourself. And the power begins with how you control your thinking. So create positive thoughts. Believe in yourself. Take responsibility for your life. And recognize if I start thinking like a happy person, I'll start improving the quality of my relationships. I'll start removing stress from my body. And that already is creating health. I can look at my body in the mirror and I can tell myself, I am happy. I am healthy. I am strong. I am love and light. I am spiritual power. You can say whatever you want. Just make sure it sounds good. And if, dear one, you are saying I am healthy, you will create health in your body. I'm getting healthier every day. If your logical mind has difficulty accepting I am healthy, then use a different version. I am getting healthier every day. Both of these do the same goal. They create greater health in your life moving forward. So there's so many things you can do, but every physical experience is because of the choices that are made. So yes, physical things can create illness, but what drove us to interact with those people or have those activities or do these different physical things? It is how we are thinking. Everything comes back to the understanding in your mind. So work at that level and you'll be able to create greater health immediately. And also, dear ones, the last thing to share is that there are different layers of your mind. So consciously, you can do affirmations and problem solving and so on, but there's also higher parts of your mind that will give you intuition and guidance of the right people to connect with who empower you, like many natural healers and some doctors as well. There are many human beings that want to empower the patient to heal themselves. And your intuition will guide you to these people and help you to recognize them. Perfect. Do you have time for one more question? I want to be respectful. Yes, most certainly. Time. We have eternity. <laughs> Solid point. So um, a lot of my uh, clients and people, this one was also submitted regarding conscious relationships. So I guess a, a w good way to ask it is you know relationships are a huge struggle for people maybe the most challenging of everything even above and beyond addiction because i think relationships can be an addiction um like the codependency aspect of them first of all 
are soulmates really a thing? Does that really exist? Is there one soulmate for everybody or, or a twin flame, things like that? And I guess it's part two of that question. So I guess I'm asking you two questions. Is, um, is there any tips or advice you can give on having a conscious relationship with someone if someone's currently in a relationship where they're struggling? Hmm. What we would say is that a conscious relationship requires you to perceive and experience more of yourself. So a conscious relationship is often characterized by listening, right? By being able to perceive the other person better. So that's an expansion of your awareness. And that's one of the fundamental properties of yourself as a conscious creator. So we're going to become more aware. We're going to become a better listener, a better observer. We're going to also become more aware of how I feel and how they feel. Another part, the one, is your intelligence. So I need to understand my partner better. And I need to understand myself as well, because I have to communicate about what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling this way. I'm going to have to understand different aspects of my experience. Of course, your awareness and your intelligence have to interact with forms. So you have to feel your own emotions and you have to connect with the forms around you. You have to become more aware of your partner. So a conscious relationship is really just the expansion of your consciousness into life. We often talk about it as caring more, which is life energy and unity and a greater understanding of oneness, right? listening, em empathically engaging. So I feel your emotions, you feel my emotions. We try to understand each other this way. So it's just about becoming more connected and present. And it's really something that everyone is moving more towards. Now, if we're trying to be conscious, that means we're trying to wake up and that's going to improve any part of our life. If you're trying to increase the happiness in your romance, yes, waking up is going to do it. If you're trying to increase the success of your career, waking up is going to do that as well because you're becoming more aware, more intelligent, and more energetic in your reality. Now, you asked us, still one about soulmates and twin flames. Well, looking at the way they are often described in this world, what we see, dear one, is that there are many, many soulmates. If you meet someone on a soul level and you feel a connection that is usually recognized as existing beyond just this one lifetime, such as a multi-lifetime soul friend or soul family member, soul mate, or even something more significant, feeling about a spiritual reality, partnership, right? then you start to recognize, yes, they're a soulmate. I know them on a different level. I feel like I remember them. I feel strong connections. So there are many, many soulmates for all of us because after all, we exist for eternity and we have many, many lifetimes. It's even possible that in a single lifetime, you would meet many soulmates. According to our understanding, what characterizes them is you interact on a soul level, on a level that's beyond the human reality. And again, we're just looking at your terminology. From our perspective, every single relationship is God. So you're always interacting with God. You're just desiring versions of God that are more similar to you and what you desire to experience in that moment. So you will attract to yourself different people and opportunities in any area of your life, in romance, in career, or other areas that are based upon resonating with you in vibration. So from our perspective, everything's God, everything's a soul mate. Even, dear one, the next breath you take within your body is a mate for your soul. Now, with the idea of twin flames, again, that is defined differently. Um, there's so much uh, conflict in this definition. Some people say, well, your soul mate is someone you can have a happy relationship with that you know from other lifetimes. And a twin flame is someone who triggers you so much because they're, they're so deeply known to yourself. And, and we say, eh, we wouldn't say it quite like that. In fact, we might even disagree in some cases. But what we say is that often a twin flame would be a soul that you've shared many similar experiences with. Now, we understand the definition is often, well, your soul split into two, but we say God split into infinite souls. So again, everything could be a split from yourself at a higher level. That means everything's a twin flame, right? Because it's all one consciousness divided in infinite ways. And depending on where you focus 
on that timeline of division is where you're going to draw the line and say, this is a soulmate, this is a twin flame. Um, but usually a, tw a twin flame has more similarity, more connection, uh, a greater relevance to the human awakening process. So with greater experiences of unity, often there are greater challenges. The light deal one reveals our ignorance to help us learn and grow. The light reveals what we're not aware of to help us perceive more. And the light is the creative power. So with more light, we create more masterfully. So our soulmates challenge us because we are so illuminated together that it accelerates our awakening. And the twin flames would be characterized as the greatest connections that we have. Are there many twin flames? Again, it depends where you draw the lines. From our perspective, everyone is the same. We appear as different. We harmonize based upon vibrational alignments and we do not divide reality into these separate things. And you are experiencing life from your perspective, and that's what makes you unique. But everything you're relating to is the same as yourself. And when we realize this, we treat everything with love. We might not agree with everybody because our vibrations are different, and that's okay. The universe has similarity and differences, and we can still have unconditional love for all of life's beautiful forms. Thank you so much. Well, that was a very unique, I've never heard that definition mm -hmm. of the either one so yeah yeah sometimes it's challenging because we see reality differently from the human than the human mind the human mind likes to divide things according to its perspective we like to divide things from our perspective and in our perspective it's all unity so it's real difficult to create any divisions sometimes people say oh that's romantic thinking and we say well then come up on here because this place is filled with love so there wasn't any like the pre-birth plan like like a blueprint where it's been determined you're going to meet this person and marry oh, yes. them yeah and you make those plans many times oh you do oh yeah you can say i want to meet this person this soul family member this soul mate at this time for, for these reasons it's not that you always have to incarnate with your favorite soul friend it's more like i'm awakening to more of who i am as god and this soul family member this soul mate will help me facilitate this part of the process. And so we do make agreements. We don't like the word contract because contract is enforceable from an external party, right? A oh, purpose of a contract is to say two people agree and there's a third party that enforces that agreement. And we see it as no, it's an agreement with only two parties. I'm gonna create this experience with this other soul. There's no God, the authority figure with a hammer and gavel that's going to strike you down if you violate this contract. There's still a lot of religious conditioning in a negative sense that's carried over into modern day spirituality. And people like to avoid responsibility and thus they create stories that there's a power outside of myself that's determining the bad things that are happening. I determine the good things that happen, but the power outside of myself determines the bad things. And so they invent these ideas of things that are not actually perceivable. So with different souls, we do make agreements and we plan before we come into this world. Look at your life. It's not random. It's not random at all. You've chose your parents. You've chose the people closest to you. You are choosing the people and the forms you attract. And the more psychically aware you become, the more you can sense the arrival of important people in your lifetime. All of you can practice this, but you have to develop that higher consciousness part of yourself to get this information. Remember, the more we ascend, the more our intelligence grows, our perceptual awareness grows, and our creative power grows. So as you ascend into a greater version of yourself, you become a more successful creator. You have access to more. So yes, there are contracts and agreements, definitely, and they're not enforced by any third party, not even this idea of an external God. You are God, and if you want to create it, you can create it. And if you want to co-create it with another version of God, another soul, then you can co-create it together. And if you decide, I don't want to do that anymore, then it doesn't happen. There's no one that's going to punish you. We punish ourselves because... We live with fear. We make choices out of fear and not out of happiness. And that's why we suffer, because we resist that which we want to experience. 
We have doubt, insecurity, shame and guilt, and so on. So don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. Live in love. Right? Live in love and understand everything is one. Everything's supporting me. How can I support myself in a greater way? And let your experience be your teacher. As was said earlier, there are levels to your mind. You might not be aware of all the parts you influencing this experience. But if you start feeling the emotions in your body, you'll connect with those deeper parts of your mind. And there might be some beliefs that are fear-based. So understand your experience is your teacher. Learn about yourself by watching the interaction of yourself and the world. And now you'll realize how the creative process works. You can't just hope for it and expect it to happen. You have to connect into yourself and create it. Hope is not enough. Hope is motivational and that's good. But hope must be combined with other characteristics that allow you to connect like trust and confidence, like patience, awareness, compassion, lots of different feelings, lots of different pieces of knowledge that complete this process of spirit connecting into matter. So you made me think of one more quick question. It's probably not quick, but free will. It sounds like we have free will, but might be a little bit restricted, especially by these pre-birth plans that we create. Mm. Or no, agreements. because uh, we understand what you're saying, but we would say, no, that assumption's inaccurate because you created the pre-birth plans and you oh. can change them. So nothing outside of you made them for you. It's just you forgot that you made them when you come into the world and you wanted to forget so that you could have the value of what this human experience is. You see, there's other types of experiences that all of you souls are having that do not include divine forgetfulness, right? The human experience is unique because it has divine forgetfulness. You can think of all these different realities we incarnate into as souls like different video games that we play in our video game system. And this video game has these characteristics and that video game has those characteristics. It's like that. And in the human experience, part of this is nearly complete forgetfulness of your divine qualities. And so along the journey of your lifetime, you wake up into remembrance of your divine qualities. You are free. You are absolutely free. And you're not aware of all that you are. So you're not experiencing all of your awareness, intelligence, and creative energy. But at the level you are aware, you can interact. And you've always been free to interact the way you choose. Now, a lot of this the, and the difficulty people have is we don't know we're consciousness. We think we're the body or the mind or the beliefs or the emotions. And so as a result, we just do everything our thoughts say. But we're not realizing that our thoughts are our emotions. Our thoughts and our emotions are part of the body's memory-based structure. And so the emotions and the thoughts are talking to you. And you listen and you think, hmm, do I like those thoughts? Do I want to use my old understanding? Or you can consciously in the present moment remember something else. What did I read yesterday? Oh, yes, I'd rather do that than what my memories are telling me to do. So consciously, you can use your memory. Consciously, you can use lots of things like imagination and speech and thinking. And so you can choose, am I going to use what my past is telling me as my reactions? Or am I going to choose consciously something else? So you're free to operate in the present moment, but most human beings that are unawakened, they don't recognize themselves as consciousness. So it feels like a completely controlled existence. And there are so many powers in this world that are designed to help you awaken by reducing and making more difficult your awakening process. Now, this is something that often a lot of people don't like to hear about because it ruffles their feathers. But there are systems in the world that want to keep people ignorant and afraid and fighting with each other and feeling, feeling powerless. But even that is part of the perfect design of spiritual awakening. You see, suffering is the motivation for happiness. Because the more you suffer, the stronger your desire to change your life becomes. And if the world's not helping you, then you have to look somewhere else. And eventually you'll look at yourself. Eventually you'll say, you know what, I'm going to do it. And now you've recognized yourself as a creator. And then you start exploring and studying and receiving support from the world that is helping you understand yourself as consciousness. 
And everything changes when you wake up as consciousness, because now you're not controlled by your mind. Now you're the creator of your mind's expression. So the world has these systems of limitation, and they create the fuel for the fire, right? They create the catalyst for the awakening. So we shouldn't hate the darkness of the world. Instead, we should realize its purpose. Its purpose, dear one, is to motivate and inspire you to change. So when you see suffering, you want to become a better person. When you witness suffering in the world, you want to help out. When you witness suffering in your own life, you want to find a solution. Instead of pretending that suffering doesn't exist, instead of hating suffering and condemning it, why not embrace suffering and say, what does suffering do to me? And you'll look and you say, at the end of this process, when I stop resisting it and I accept this is part of my experience, suffering becomes my motivation. Nobody wants to suffer. And suffering itself is designed to propel you in the opposite direction. Suffering is designed to motivate you to wake up and change. So everything in this reality is perfectly designed. Nothing is out of place from our perspective. Thank you. I love that so much. You're very welcome. I'm... Sorry. Well, you're very welcome. And we're very happy that you've invited us here upon your show. We hope that everyone who joined with us felt some divine energy, felt some happiness within, and also got some ideas that started to increase curiosity, have you look a little differently at your life. Because ultimately, you are here to awaken to yourself. The universe placed you at the center of your reality. You're the most important part of your experience that you will ever discover. So desire to know yourself better and awaken to a greater experience of yourself. And then, dear one, our work will be done and your work, dear one, will become so much more joyous. And we thank you for this opportunity and we wish you all love and light, peace and happiness on your spiritual journey. Thank you. So how do you feel after a channel? Do you feel oh, energi yeah. energized or? Yeah, I feel amazing. Um, yeah, I feel my whole body's buzzing and vibrating. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot more light mm -hmm. shining out of myself. Uh, really happy. Like, uh, yeah, really, really happy. And for no reason at all. It's just that's like awesome. I'm happy to be alive because um, that's the quality of this energy. Um, and the more I've channeled, the more I can go into it just because I open myself up to be a better channel. So I receive more of that energy and then I get to also experience the benefit of that spiritual connection. That's awesome. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, can anybody learn how to channel? Anybody can definitely, but you have to put in the work. Um, so like I said, I've channeled thousands of hours, probably tens of thousands of hours because um, I channel, yeah, I, I've been doing this for almost 20 years and say I channel anywhere from like two to six hours a day. And that has been the case almost for most of those years. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I've put in tens of thousands of hours over this time. And if you would look at my YouTube videos, because they've been online for almost 20 years, you'll see I've changed a lot. Yeah. My personality is really different. How I express is different. It really brought me into my reality in a much stronger way because I was a, a very introverted person, very quiet, very aware and perceptive, but also very distant from life. And so I chose a spiritual path that made me more distant, all this Zen meditation, you know, and don't talk and like minimal movement. And then the higher self opened my heart and brought me in my reality and helped me understand that um, there's more than just going into emptiness, like a lot of meditations do. The mm -hmm. goal is to understand ourselves as consciousness, but not to disconnect from the rest of our reality. We find ourselves as something greater than the mind-body structure. And then we come into that mind-body structure to experience the fullness of ourselves as God. So God is awareness, intelligence, and energy. And if we meditate too much, sometimes it makes us only increasing the awareness. And then we don't benefit as more energy and more intelligence. And the same can happen. Yeah. And the same kind of manifestation teaching. Sometimes we become obsessed with doing too much and then we lose our awareness. We lose wisdom and growth. We're always trying to make it happen and pushing, but we're not actually growing because we're not noticing cause and effect and trying to quiet down and trying to perceive more. So if we go too much external, we lose the awareness to internal. We have too much awareness so it's really about a teaching for balance in our lives and embracing the inner and the outer. 
I noticed that with myself because I, I love learning and I would kind of, I go overboard to where I'm constantly listening to other things, other people's. And, you know, recently I've been like, okay, I'm going to go on a walk in nature with my dog, who, by the way, I am so sorry during the channel. I don't know if it, I was, it was <laughs> like during an imp important part <laughs> that was my dog doing some sort of like wheezing coughing. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wasn't enjoying the channeling. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was down, you know. Oh. But um, yeah, that was my dog. So yeah, so now I go out in nature with my dog and, and I leave my phone at home because I'm too tempted still to reply to notifications. So like, that's what I have to do for myself. And it's like so good. I'm like, why don't I do this all the time? This is so much better, you know, just actually forcing yeah. myself to, because my thing's too, too much external, like input, input, input all the time. <laughs> So it's good. Yeah, it is good. And you have to honor yourself. And if we notice what we're doing benefits us, then we should keep doing it because sometimes we do need to go within more. Sometimes we need to be more involved in the world. And often it oscillates throughout our days. Like we need like yeah, an hour of rest, like an hour of me time. Like we should feel good about that and not guilty. Yeah. I think sometimes the problem is that the external world really pulls on us because we have all these things going on in our world and we forget to make the choice to listen to our body or listen to our mind or listen to our higher consciousness and sometimes take a break from external interaction and, you know, give ourselves some of that me time and that inner quiet. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect advice. So, so how can people, I'm going to put this in the show notes, but how can people find you? Yeah. So my website's channelhigherself.com. And then it's the same name on YouTube. So my YouTube channel is channel higher self. Um, you can uh, look at my videos there. I have, um, I think it's like 2,600 videos right now. So I've been doing this wow. a long time. Yeah. And um, I do personal sessions. So you can work me one-on-one -on -one. like Mary Beth, you had a few of those. Mm -hmm. Those are real powerful because you get specific guidance like yes. in our talk today, it was a lot of general information, but as you got to see, there was a unique way of explaining it in a way that made sense. Mm -hmm. And the higher self is like a master of being a good explainer of things and helping us to like see things at deeper levels and see how things are connected. So in these personal sessions, I mean, as you could probably share, I don't want to you know intrude, but it's deeply personal because yeah. there's some like psychic readings and channelings that are very vague like you're a star being and you're here to save the world. And it's like, you could say it to everybody, but the higher oh, I ask some embarrassing yeah. questions for myself. Like I'm, you guys, <laughs> <laughs> it is worth it. Like I said, 10 years of therapy in addition to like, cause I ask questions. You, you didn't stop me from asking anything. Like before no, you, you started channeling, really I was like, can I ask you about health? And you're like, yeah. I'm like, can I ask you about um, relationships, career? We did all the big things, you yeah. know, even, um, we even discussed my mom who who died a couple years ago on Christmas Day. We she even we discussed her. Um, we didn't do like a channeling from her, but we talked about her and you yeah, let me know how she was beings. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You let the yeah. higher self let me know she was doing really good. We'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah. and that was yeah. great to hear. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, when I channel a when I channel to look at other beings, I see them as if they're standing in front of me, and they'll show me pictures or they'll animate their body in some way or knowings will come through that I'll communicate about. So I don't let other beings in my system. As you're aware, when I channel, like I hold a lot of energy and the higher self has a very specific quality because it's at this higher level of consciousness. So it feels very loving and very wise. And I get to embody and feel what that's like. If I was going to channel a different being, I would put that being's energy in my body and I would feel like I'm being it. And I just have never desired that. Yeah, It's like, you know, I mean, I've never had it, but like, if you could have caviar, would you rather have caviar or like, you know, potato chip? It's like, well, yeah, you'd want the caviar. I, I'd rather have a potato chip, but that's yeah, just I've never had caviar, so I don't know what it tastes like, but yeah, that's not, not good. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's real My salty. Opinion. Yeah. Um, so if you want to like, if you could feel this bliss consciousness and communicate from this state of wisdom, why would you not choose that? Why would you choose a lesser form? And what I realized is when I'm in that higher state, I can still get information about other people and you, they disappear in that non-physical space. You just call them up and then they come and then they can have that sort of dialogue and they can share information. Well, what I will share with the audience is like the health question, like 
for three years, I'm going to doctors with autoimmune issues, which I don't call autoimmune diseases. I call them autoimmune responses. I was having a response to something and they couldn't figure it out. I kept getting prescription after prescription. And luckily I only took one of them and I got worse. And I just knew they're giving me these prescriptions. I didn't get them filled because I'm not a prescription person, but that was their only solution. They couldn't figure it out. And, and you confirmed and helped figure out new things that I wasn't aware of. And Lincoln, I was a little bit mad at you. Like I was like, what? I got your email. I know. And I'm like, give it time. It's like three days. <laughs> but also and I forgot. And you didn't follow all the advice right away. I didn't. And I, I, I also, there was something that I forgot that I was um, eating that, um, <laughs> and that I was like, oh yeah, I felt so bad. I was like, I don't think you're right about this. Like I was like, and plus, I just wanted to fight because I was still like, I was like, <laughs> Yeah, well, and, hey, you want to get good advice. I totally understand, you know. And, but and I still have been like cheating. I would like do a little cheat now and then, like with some things you told me to stay away from, and then every time it burned me. So I was like, dang. I, and I keep telling people, I just need to listen to Lincoln. He's right, and I just, but I didn't want to believe it because I was in denial. But they well, say thinking, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, I mean, I was in it. Yeah, and you're getting pleasure from those things. So there's there's reasons. There's chemical pleasure. There's emotional pleasure. We might have an association. Like yes. dairy is very much a nurturing quality. I mean, our, mm -hmm. it's from like mother's milk, whether it's a, a cow, a goat, a sheep, or human. You know, it's still that same nurturing quality, and it can connect to memories and emotional aspects of wanting to feel nurtured. So there's a lot of reasons why we get happiness from different foods. And if we do them in excess, then yeah, it can cause an imbalance and an allergy oftentimes, yeah. or maybe sometimes it never caused us a problem before. And now it does because the universe is saying, okay, you're ready to work through this issue. Like, why are you addicted to this food, including yes. substances? Cause like, you know, alcohol and cannabis and tobacco, they're foods, but they're just really strong foods. So we classify them differently, but we can get addicted to those foods or addicted to sugars or, you know, lots of foods can be addictive and sometimes it's emotional. So we're not bad for wanting to feel a certain way, but we can learn how to feel that way or even better using different choices. Yeah. Like, you said so many things in the channel and I was like, no, geez, what? Like I was like <laughs> fixated, but you know, also, I mean, there was a lot more than just the dairy, like that we discussed with my health and like literally all of my issues vanish when I just listened to you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, I cheated a little bit. I was testing it and that's yeah. okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. You want to, wasn't worth life. it. My face blows yeah, that's, up. That's like, how you learn. Yeah. But yeah. also like I have been a food addict, you know, my, my entire life. So yeah. it was, it's, 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 I feel like my body's kind of just telling me you're done with everything processed, everything with toxins, everything like you're just done. You can't have this, this food anymore. You're it's not a match at a certain level. It's not worth it. Um, and we're ascending. And like, if you're becoming more of who you want to be, you're noticing what's in alignment with that. So the more you consciously create yourself, the more you like take responsibility and understand your role in all the different choices you make. And the benefit is you get to have the quality of life that you want. And it's like short-term pleasure versus long-term pleasure, yeah. you know, and we realize it's not worth it anymore. That little chemical change, it's not worth having a big experience of suffering. Like alcohol. I had to learn that one too. I mean, well, yep, my body's rejecting everything we'll that's lo lower frequency substances or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, we all have our lessons. Yeah, definitely. So yes. self love, self, don't get angry at yourself. Have fun with it. I've gone through <laughs> so many experiments trying to figure stuff out, you know, and going through my own journey of listening to my higher self and having resistance towards it because there's just other parts of us from our past that got happiness doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's time to outgrow those parts. And we noticed yeah. it, but they're not bad. We're not bad. We're just growing. And if we can look at it like that, we stop fighting with ourselves and feeling guilty and doing that whole self-abuse thing. I'm still drinking coffee though. I just quit put, putting the heavy whipping cream in it, but you'll, you'll know you're done. You'll know you're done when the experience shows you that mm -hmm. you'll stop enjoying it or some negative consequence will happen. And then it's okay. Universe. Now it's time to change this part of my life. Oh, it wasn't worth it because every time I would have it, my eyes were swollen shut when I wake yeah. up the next morning. So mm -hmm. my body's definitely like, you're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's wonderful. You can thank the universe. Thank your body. Thank you. 
and your quality of life will be better because you'll know what it's like to feel more like me. Like yes. coffee can create like jitters and raciness and stress. And we get off the caffeine and realize, wow, this is what it feels like to be me again. Like I oh, forgot. Oh, I'm still this. drinking the caffeine though. <laughs> Just half calf now. <laughs> just not, no, no heavy whipping cream. Just plain <laughs> black, which I never thought that I would do, but that's, here I am. Yeah, well, you're doing great. You're My doing eyes great. are open, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Wonderful. So um, thank you so much, Lincoln. And everybody, I highly recommend doing a session with Lincoln. It is so worth it. I did two. I'm, I'm sure that wasn't my last session either, by the way. So um, if you like this video, please go ahead and hit like and share with your friends. Anyone you think this could help uh, plant a seed about expanding your consciousness and go ahead and subscribe to my new channel, Spiritual Transformation. So thank you, Lincoln. I really appreciate your time. We talked a long time. And we did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mary Beth. Had a great I could talk time. for many more hours, but I got to respect your so time. so much fun together, yeah. I know. Well, thank you so much. And bye, everyone. Bye.